Uh, next is RS22506, Medical Assistance, Representative Rushi. Excuse me while I change folders here. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee, uh, for taking up this very important issue. I understand that Medicaid coverage is a difficult issue for many of you to face this year, but it's of great impact to the state and the citizens of Idaho. I'd like to talk about the importance of covering working adults who are not eligible for subsidized health insurance through the, our health exchange, and then of the foreseeable consequences of inaction. Then I'll go through the very simple bill, which is almost identical to one this committee printed last year. First of all, Idaho is a low-wage state. We've heard that we have the highest rate of um, minimum wage jobs, that our mean household income is 50th of 51. When translated into the realm of health insurance, that means that there are a lot of Idahoans who would qualify for subsidized health insurance. It's estimated that about 75% of Idaho households earn below 400% of the federal poverty level, which is the op upper limit of earnings for exchange subsidies. But there's also a lower limit of income, a floor amount required for exchange participation because the U.S. Supreme Court decision and the state's inaction, about 80 to 100,000 Idahoans earn too much for Medicaid coverage, but too little to qualify for the exchange. These Idahoans are too poor for federal help getting health insurance without your concurrence. So what happens to these citizens, the working poor, when they do not have coverage? First, their health is poor. They die more frequently than those with coverage. The magnitude of the excess burden of disease and death is summarized in a recent article from the Harvard Medical School staff, and I believe copies were disseminated to the committee earlier. I draw your attention to a couple of charts that summarize that information. This first one, which I think you have on a uh, landscape view, summarizes the national data. And what it shows is the incidence of disease in an overall population, the percent of change in the disease burden with coverage, and then in the last column, the number of persons avoided uh, with adverse outcomes who whose uh, adverse outcome is avoided because of coverage. The second chart is specific to those particular states who have opted not to expand Medicaid. And I get, again, I draw your attention to the Idaho line. And the, real, the really important thing there is, is uh, that they estimate that between 76 and 190 Idahoans will have um, will die when they don't need to. That's about 100 deaths a year that are avoidable. There's also evidence that insured individuals miss less work and have better work performance. And if any population cannot afford to miss work, it's those working at, at below 100 to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. So what does it cost us to save 100 or so lives each year and improve the lives and health of these Idaho citizens. The fiscal note explains it fairly clearly. It doesn't cost the state and local taxpayers money. It saves. The cost of covering this population and removing the state and county liability for the indigent fund, including our CAT fund, has been studied and restudied. Our own governor and panel to work group, we have both the Milliman and Levitt uh, actuarial analysis and physicist financial consultants, and numerous outside organizations pointing out that with the schedule of federal funding, which is 100% for the first three years, 95% for two years, and 90% for the years after uh, of the claims expense, when matched against the expected cost to counties through the indigent fund, to the state through the CAT fund, and to the State Departments of Corrections and Health and Welfare for Community Services, the savings are in the $500 million range. You should have a couple of charts from the Milliman Report, and I believe they also have access to the total report. This chart 
shows the annual savings. And you can s the difference between the two lines is the amount of money that is saved by participating in with the federal government in Medicaid coverage. As you can see, the biggest savings occur in the first few years, as one would expect when the feds were covering 100 percent. But there is no year, there is no year that is not a savings over the top line, which is our current policy. <coughs> the second chart that I think is on the back of your sheet uh, is merely a cumulative savings or cost to the state. The top line again being the current state and the dotted line being what happens with expansion. So I've heard a couple of concerns about the financials. The first is, what if the federal government doesn't come through? What if they lower the payments? First of all, the Affordable Care Act includes payments through 2024. They don't have to have further appropriation. And second, the Supreme Court held that the coverage is optional. We can remove or repeal it if there is a better way to meet the needs of those Idahoans at a lower cost. Another comment was the need that we felt the need to cut the federal deficit, so, so we should refuse the federal help. Interestingly, I've not heard that with PILT, Craig Wyden funds, crop supports for INL or almost any other program. In fact, we're currently seeking federal funds for clean water primacy, for education networks, and numerous other activities that benefit Idaho citizens. And, and should we refuse the help, it will not lower the deficit or the taxes on Idahoans we're still going to have to pay our federal taxes. Well, that's not exactly right. Should we refuse the coverage, the major businesses estimate that they will have an additional tax burden of between 12 and a half and 18 million dollars in additional fees and taxes. That's why IACI supports ex the coverage extension. Certainly the medical communities and the hospitals do too. Our hospitals, especially our community hospitals, will lose dish or disproportionate share hospital payments used to help offset the cost of unpaid care. Without this revenue, the smallest hospitals will have trouble making their budgets. The larger hospitals will ship the cost to the commercially insured population. The increase in the percentage of covered lives that the hospitals would see was designed to cover the shortfall in dish funding. But it'll only happen if the coverage is extended. The list of supporters is long. They recognize the financial benefit and the health benefit of extending health insurance coverage to working Idahoans too poor for exchange financial support. But one thing they and most Idaho residents also believe is that we should have a fair and balanced playing field. I submit that to provide coverage for those in the gap between current Medicaid eligibility and eligibility for the exchange is only fair. It gives them a fair chance at health, at being able to work, and indeed for their life. Mr. Chairman, committee, the reasons are clear. I believe the bill is too. It merely states that those eligible under Title 19 of the Social Security Act and not covered under other programs are eligible for a plan that conforms to federal rules and meets the restrictions on page 7. Those features require medical necessity and personal accountability. Members of the committee, that's why the bill, and that's why now, is fiscally responsible and a clinically appropriate way to care for those working Idahoans who cannot get coverage and whose expenses fall to the indigent program. It saves lives and it saves money. I urge you to introduce the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Rushi. Appreciate that very much. Um, are there any questions? Uh, of Representative Rushi or comments of Representative Rushi. Uh, 